Welcome everyone to Lady in the Library. This video will be about a beautiful ancient Egyptian artifact, oddly dubbed the Unlucky Mummy. It's been quite an interesting topic to research because as far as I can tell, there are several different stories about the origin of this unlucky mummy. Each is slightly different than the other, but I've pieced together the most common aspects of each of them here. So let's find out more about this unlucky mummy and who she was, where she came from, and where she is now. So let's take a trip across the world to Egypt, my favorite place, in the late 1880s. Four young, rich Englishmen were strolling through the city one day when they were approached by a local Arab man. He wanted to show them something that he had discovered on a dig in Luxor. The men, of course, were very curious, as I would be, so the seller revealed a beautifully decorated sarcophagus. The colors are still very beautiful and vibrant and rich, considering it's about 3,000 years old. Now, when I was doing my research on this, I thought this was a full-on sarcophagus with the mummy and everything attached, but nope. Only the top portion of the coffin lid remained. Her mummified remains were not attached, and her whereabouts are unfortunately still unknown. The lid itself is made of wood and plaster, 64 inches long, with a woman's face carved into it. It appears to be her death mask, a representation of her when she was alive. The inscription on her sarcophagus doesn't have a name on it, but it described her as being a high priestess of Amun-Ra. For this video, I think we'll give her a name when referring to her sarcophagus, the coffin lid itself, and Amunet sounds perfect. In Egyptian, it means hidden one, so I think it fits. So anyways, one gentleman purchased Amunet, but that night he was seen leaving his hotel room and walking off into the desert, never to return. His friend, Thomas Douglas Murray, had Amunet shipped back to his home in London. Just a few days later, Thomas was out duck hunting along the Nile River when his shotgun exploded, injuring his arm. It took at least 10 days, from what I understand, to make it back to Cairo, but it was just too late to save his infected arm. Meanwhile, his two other companions fell into complete financial ruin and poverty within a couple years. An excerpt from Montague Summers' Witchcraft and Black Magic also says, quote, Two servants who had handled the mummy case, perhaps without sufficient respect, both died within a twelve-month, whilst a far swifter fate overtook a third who had made a jesting sally. Thomas finally returned home in London to find Aminette on display, but he wasn't exactly greeted by the same charming priestess he had seen in Cairo. Now the woman's face seemed cold and angry, so something was very wrong. Sometime later, Madame Blavatsky, hope I pronounced that right, a woman with clairvoyant ability said that she detected an evil influence coming from Aminette and informed Thomas that there was just no way to get rid of the evil within it. From here, Aminette was handed off to several people and each experiencing horrible life events following. A journalist who asked to borrow Aminette for research soon regretted it when it brought nothing but bad luck and ruin to her life and relationship. She then returned it to Thomas, who then gifted it to his friend Mr. Wheeler, kind of like hot potato here, but his time with it was short-lived, and he gave it to his sister before he passed away. Even his sister experienced nothing but bad luck and heartache when she took possession of Aminet. When she took it to be photographed, she was absolutely horrified that in the photo there was a real Egyptian woman's face staring back at them with hatred in her eyes. The photographer died just a few weeks later. I do wonder if that photograph still exists somewhere. You never know. She decided to get rid of Amunet after that and offered it to the British Museum, and they accepted it. When it was finally being loaded into the museum, however, the handler fell and broke his leg, while the other man strangely died within a week. Supposedly, anyone who photographed Amunet or drew sketches of her was punished. When a second photographer had taken a photo of Amunet and captured that same angry face, he showed the image to Egyptologist E.A. Wallace Budge before going home and tragically taking his own life. Wallace Budge was told the story surrounding the coffin, and he was really worried that the priestess was angry and upset about where she was being displayed. Each night, the guards and maids heard crying and banging noises coming from Aminette. Rumors were that two night guards died mysteriously and that others were refusing to go near her. Well, I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to be near some cursed... No, yeah, I would. I take that back. I... My curiosity would get the better of me. <laughs> Supposedly, an Egyptologist died shortly after studying her, and a child who had thrown a tissue onto Aminette while making a rude remark later became ill and died. Quite concerned with this, as he should be, 
Walls Budge arranged for Amonet to be displayed in her own case with a notice attached to it filled with praise for the priestess. Most of the issues seemed to fade once he did that. Wallace Budge said many things about Omnet, but one of the last statements that he made was in 1934, when he denied that the British Museum ever owned any artifact that was connected with such a bad reputation. He said that Omnet had never left the museum once she was brought there. He kind of contradicts himself a few times with what he says about her, but oddly, he died that same year. A very strange coincidence. Hmm. A journalist named Bertram Fletcher Robinson spent months trying to figure out if these rumors around Omnet were even true. Supposedly, he was able to verify the rumors, but before he finished his work, he too died suddenly at the age of 36. Sir Arthur Doyle, the famed author of Sherlock Holmes, who happened to be a close friend of his, remarked how odd his passing was. He wrote that it was caused by Egyptian elementals guarding a female mummy, and that he had warned Robinson from the start that he was tempting fate by pursuing his inquiries. What ended up propelling Aminette into the spotlight was one tragic night in 1934. There were rumors that she was on board the ill-fated ocean liner, the RMS Titanic. Survivors reported that the very well-known journalist of the time, William Thomas Stead, recounted to his fellow passengers intriguing stories late into the night, including one about the curse of a mummy. He knew Thomas Murray, the man who had purchased her in Cairo, personally and studied Aminette himself. Mere hours later, the ship struck an iceberg, sending its crew into action. William heroically helped women and children onto lifeboats. He was last seen returning to the first class smoking room to read. His life, unfortunately, was lost with so many others that night. While this tragedy was certainly not caused by a mummy's curse, it didn't stop several newspapers from associating the two after the ship sank. Speculation and rumors flourished that an ancient Egyptian priestess was angry and vengeful. So how did they explain Amna ending up on the Titanic? Well, the legend goes that the British Museum was just so worried about the strange occurrences surrounding Amna that they replaced her with an exact replica to be displayed while moving her to the basement. Later, when a wealthy American collector visited the museum and noticed right off that the lid was a fraud, he requested to see the original and then bought it, despite their warnings. He then set sail on the RMS Titanic with his purchase. When the ship hit the iceberg, he bribed a lifeboat attendant to let the mummy have a seat. After making it back to America, he then sold Omnet to another owner in Canada. He was then on board the Empress of Ireland that also sank. Oddly enough. All in all, though, somehow it ended up back in the British Museum, safe and sound. Despite all the rumors about everything, the Titanic's cargo log says nothing about a mummy or even any ancient artifact being on board. So there's no evidence that Amina ever left London at all. She's been there the whole time, never moving from her case except during war times to the basement for safety. So there's the whole Titanic conspiracy in a nutshell and why people think that a mummy sank the Titanic. An interesting newspaper clipping from the Omaha Daily Bee printed June 7, 1914 says, The mummy case is that of Princess Hattari, daughter of Pharaoh Amenhotep III of the 18th dynasty, one of the greatest pharaohs of ancient Egypt, aka the father of Akhenaten, who was the husband of Nefertiti. And I'm totally getting the mummy vibes here. 18th dynasty pharaohs and cursed mummies. Yeah. Anyways, it goes on to say, the princess was a priestess of the temple of Amun-Ra and lived about 3,000 years ago. That the princess Hattari deserted the temple of Amun-Ra in order to aid her half-brother who was fighting for the throne, Akhenaten. The curse of the god has rested upon her ever since, and history tells us that she was murdered by a devotee of Amun-Ra, but was buried with royal honors. Now, that's pretty much fake news. As far as I'm aware, Amenhotep III did not have a daughter named Hattare, at least not a known priestess daughter who was murdered, that I'm aware of. Though, pharaohs did have a lot of, a lot of daughters and well, kids and wives, but that's a whole other story. While there's no truth to that particular news article, and it's a rather romantic tale, we may never know the true origin of this priestess, who she was, how she died, and where her mummified remains are today. I will say that, interesting enough, that story does fit the physical appearance of the younger lady found in Tomb KV-35. It's just a coincidence, really, and the younger lady deserves a video all her own, so we'll get to that later. 
What likely happened here was an ancient Egyptian artifact was purchased during an era of increased interest in all things paranormal and ancient Egyptian. Purses and life on the other side of the veil were very popular topics. Several scholarly minds at the time tried to find logical explanations for the events behind this case, but ended up a part of its tragic history. So we may never know who this woman was in life, who the face was that peered out from those photographs, where those photographs are because I'd like to see them, and what her fate was. I hope the priestess found peace at last. Ancient Egyptians wanted to live forever and to be remembered, and this priestess definitely will. So do you guys think the mummy's curse is real? It seemed pretty real enough with King Tut, but do you think she was actually on the Titanic and there's some huge cover-up? What name do you think would suit a beautiful High Priestess of Amun-Ra? Let me know in the comments below, and also what videos you'd like to see next. I love doing kind of shorter videos of funner topics and here and there, so let me know what you think. So thank you guys for listening, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and hit the notification bell to be alerted when the next one is posted. Until next time, take care everyone, bye! Cairo, but... Need water! <clears throat>it is a fun rumor well it's not really a fun rumor he kind of contradicts himself a few times with what he says but oddly he died that same year strange coincidence was it a coincidence with all the issues with king tut i don't know just saying